In the life of a great composer, it is usually easy to discern the roots of his genius in a background of family music, for example, in early nurturing by teachers or by some remarkable performing talent which catches the public eye. In the case of Johannes Brahms, all of these features are there, but only to a very modest degree. Brahms was born in Hamburg on March 26, 1835. Hamburg is now, as then, a great seaport, a proud and busy city. Brahms was born in a house in what is now the old town. The building was destroyed in the Second World War, but on the second floor of this house lived the Brahms family, in an area that certainly in 1835 was poverty-stricken and rough, to say the least. Poor they certainly were, but Brahms family was quite unusual in several ways. His father, Johann Jakob Brahms, came from an obscure little village where his family ran an inn and a provision store. Against his family wishes, he decided to become a professional musician. He learned string and wind instruments proficiently, then left home for Hamburg, where he thought he could prosper. Of course, life in the big city was difficult. He got jobs in the taverns of the dockside, and poor lodgings there too. Slowly things improved, until by the age of 24 he was a permanent double bass player in a fashionable restaurant. He played the horn in the local militia. It brought him a meagre but stable income. He had lodged for three years in the house of an old Frau Nissen, whose daughter Christiane, at this point aged 41, ran the lodging house. Jacob decided that their ages notwithstanding, she was a step up the ladder for him, and they were married. They had three children under difficult but generally happy circumstances. Fritz, who became a musician, Johannes and Elise, whose role was to be looking after her aging parents. They were poor, but the boys were very well educated at local schools. The father did his best, and the mother cooked and cared for them with intelligence and love. Christiane Nissen had little or no education, but she was to write thoughtful and imaginative letters to her son and display real intelligence and intellect. This is not so surprising, perhaps, as her own family background could be traced through many generations of teachers and professional people. Brahms always loved and respected his father, and when the boy early showed an interest in music, he was, at the age of seven, introduced to the first of his two excellent teachers. Friedrich Wilhelm Kossel was a friend of Jacob Brahms and an excellent pianist and musician. While he taught young Brahms correct technique, he was keen to encourage the boy to search for the content of the music as well. It's hard to imagine such talent developing in such a rough world, but Brahms did so well that Kossel moved house to be near him, and Brahms spent whole days at his home. Hannes was ready for his first concert at the age of ten, arranged by his father. He played in a Beethoven piano quintet, then a Mozart piano quartet. By chance, a wealthy impresario heard him play. He had once proposed a concert tour in America, which would make them all rich. The parents were overjoyed and couldn't wait. However, Kossel said no, because he thought it would destroy Johannes. Of course, the family was not going to give up this chance easily, so Kossel had to offer something else. His own teacher had been Edward Markson, the most eminent of Hamburg music teachers. He heard the boy play and offered to teach Brahms himself 
free of charge. To Markson the parents listened, flattered by his interest, and though Kossel lost his pupil, he knew it would be best for Brahms. So the boy began the second phase of his musical studies. Markson taught him the keyboard, but as soon as Brahms showed an interest, the technicalities of composition as well. Once again, he was in the hands of a thorough and capable musician. It wasn't a life of roses, however. At 13, Brahms had to earn his keep, so he began to play dance music in the bars and taverns of the docks, just as his father had done. The long hours of practice and study, coupled with equally long hours in smoky and noisy bars, meant that he soon became frail and nervous. In the village of Vincent under Luca, a few kilometers to the southeast of Hamburg, his father had a friend, Adolf Giesemann, and for the summers of 1847 and 1848, he went to live there, teaching Lieschen, the daughter of the house, to play the piano. There he studied and wrote music, even performing it with the local choir. These creative summer holidays were to set his health to rights and establish a pattern of summer habits for his future years. Aged 16, he gave his first solo concert, but he made no great stir in a musical world used to international stars and with lots of local talent. He became quite certain that it was composition, not performance, that was to be his path. The musical world of Hamburg then, apart from Marxen, had no idea what was brewing in their midst. Compositions poured out of such quality as the lovely song Liebestreu and fine piano music and string quartets. Sadly, in later years, Brahms considered many of these pieces not good enough and destroyed them. Brahms had no close friends of like mind and his wide reading of literature and philosophy meant he was becoming more and more solitary. He taught music, played in theatres and bars, but he was getting nowhere and he needed to get out. Escape came in the form of Eduard Remanyi, a talented Hungarian violinist. Remanyi had studied at the Vienna Conservatoire but had been forced to leave Hungary for political reasons and was now trying to establish himself as a violinist in the major European cities. He needed an accompanist. They set off in 1853 and were soon visiting the concertmeister of the King of Hanover, Josef Joachim. Although only 22, Joachim was already a famous violinist, but he had been a friend of Romagni in Vienna and was happy to see him again. He was even more intrigued to meet the 20-year-old accompanist Johannes Brahms and to hear some of his compositions. After only a few days, Remiani was denounced in the Hanoverian court as a dangerous Hungarian revolutionary and he was forced to leave, but not before Joachim and Brahms had become firm friends. They went to Weimar, with a letter of introduction from Joachim to Franz Liszt, king of the German musical world. On the Altenberg, Liszt was surrounded by crowds of sycophantic composers and musicians who looked up to him as a god. Brahms, however, was not impressed by Liszt or by his music. He was also unable to gush over Liszt's compositions as everyone else did. Liszt was not amused, and Rimiani was furious, and rather than be thought of the same mind as Brahms, said that they could no longer perform together. So Brahms was turned away by Liszt and Rimiani. Stuck in Weimar, and practically penniless, it was a difficult situation. He hit on the bright idea of writing to his new friend Joachim, who was staying for the summer at Göttingen, where he was attending lectures in philosophy and history at the university. Joachim immediately invited him to stay, and in the ensuing weeks 
their lifelong friendship was sealed. At Göttingen they talked music and wrote music. Joachim was a considerable composer and Brahms liked his work. They even gave a concert together. With the money from this, Brahms set off to see the Rhine. He was impressed by the rocks and hills along the way, the kind of scenery that was quite novel to him. He met friends of Joachim at Bonn, who, as Joachim had done, recommended he visit Schumann. However, Robert Schumann, some years before, had returned unopened some manuscripts Brahms had sent, and he felt, therefore, Schumann would not be receptive to his work. But the friends, they were a musical family called Deichmann, insisted he look closely at Schumann's work, which in the comfort of their hospitable home he did. He was completely bowled over and couldn't wait to meet Schumann and play to him some of his own latest compositions. Robert Schumann was at the time living in Dusseldorf. He was highly respected and certainly considered to be one of the great masters of his age. His home was quite different from Liszt's mansion at Weimar. One of his six children let the young visitor in. There were no sycophantic hangers-on, and only Schumann and his wife Clara listened to Brahms play. This moment was the turning point in Brahms' life. He instantly felt at home here, at ease, understood, welcomed. He played to them, and just as with Joachim, they were quite overwhelmed by his music and his personality. Their diaries are full of Brahms and the effect his music had on them. The most influential musical journal of the day was Neue Zeitschrift für Musik. On October 28th, two weeks after they met, there appeared there an essay by Schumann on Brahms called Neue Bahnen, New Ways. It talked of his work in such terms as to alert the world to the work Brahms had already written at such an age and what Schumann felt certain was to come. Before he quite knew where he was, Brahms was in Leipzig at the publishers Breitkopf and Hertel. With such a remarkable introduction, they could hardly refuse to listen. Sonata Opus 1 was dedicated to Clara Schumann and Sonata Opus 2 to Joachim. Being Brahms, he thought nothing was good enough for Schumann himself. His friendship with Clara Schumann was to be one of the most remarkable of his life. Though she was the mother of six children and 14 years older than Brahms, there is little doubt that he loved her. But then he worshipped Robert and found the children charming, so where could he go? By the time he was back home in Hamburg at Christmas that year, he had had a tumultuous seven months seen his first works in print and been able to give his parents some money. From a nonentity to such fame in so short a time might have spoiled him. But he didn't. He remained as kind and thoughtful for others as ever. Of course, he continued to meet new people. Hans von Bülow he met at Joachim's house and von Bülow was the first pianist to perform his works in public at a concert in Hamburg on March 1st, 1854. As a conductor, Bülow was to continue as a major exponent of Brahms' work throughout his career. The Schumanns came to Joachim's house at the end of January and Brahms had the time of his life. Only one month later, Schumann was to be devastated by a nervous disorder which was ultimately to destroy him. Within a few days he tried to drown himself in the Rhine, and though he was saved, it was only to experience terrible mental torment. For Clara and his children, it was an appalling calamity. Brahms went straight to Dusseldorf, and unquestionably his sympathy and help was a great comfort to Clara. 
If he was supposed to be launching his career, then it had to be put aside while he could help the family. He stayed by Clara or wrote to her while she was away on tour, absolutely consumed by his love for her. It was only 18 months later that he was persuaded to give a concert with Clara herself and Joachim in Danzig. Of course, Brahms was not stealing Clara from the now insane Schumann. He wished for Schumann's recovery with all his heart. But just where he stood in all this was tearing him apart. Then in July 1856, Robert Schumann died. It was a turning point for Brahms. His father, after all, had married a woman 17 years older. Why should he not marry Clara? He chose, however, to follow his muse rather than his heart. Detmold was a small state ruled by a prince. Brahms was appointed to his first official position there in 1857. He had to teach the princess Frederica, conduct the choral society and to perform as pianist at concerts. He was required to work for only three months in the year and could comfortably live off his salary for the rest. It all worked well and compositions flowed from his pen. Then he was invited to spend the summer with friends in Göttingen. There he met Agatha von Siebold, charming, intelligent and possessed of a lovely soprano voice which could render the songs he wrote for her magnificently. But with Agatha as with Clara, although the two were undoubtedly in love and it was assumed by all their friends they would marry, Brahms could not bring himself to do it. He was to look back longingly to the girl at Göttingen, but still he felt that such a relationship would compromise his art. For Agatha it was a devastating blow. Meanwhile Brahms was suffering the only real antagonism to his music he was ever to meet. At a concert in Leipzig where he performed his piano concerto in D minor, he was actually hissed at by the audience. Brahms described the event to Clara Schumann in a letter but it didn't put him off his stride. In 1860, he gave up his secure post at Detmold. He moved back to Hamburg, not to stay with his parents, but in charming rented rooms in the suburb of Hanna. He began to make friends amongst the musical people of the city. He worked for several years with a ladies' choir, where his personality and charm seems to have worked its usual magic, particularly on a quartet of girls with whom he worked closely. They were never to forget their composer-director. Another Hamburg friend was the singer Julius Stockhausen, whose glorious voice and fine personality inspired Brahms to write some of his best songs. They gave many performances together. All this time, Brahms was hoping for a permanent post in Hamburg, where he could settle and continue his work as a composer. However, nothing was offered him. He went to Vienna for a short stay, believing that some success there in the musical capital of the world might impress people in Hamburg, who would then offer him some suitable post. Vienna for Brahms, as for many musicians, was a welcoming haven of kindred spirits. There were so many people there with real musical talent and understanding, who recognized at once Brahms' qualities, that he felt at home and a part of society there in a way he'd never felt anywhere else. He was soon in the thick of new compositions and performances, and at a level of success he found very gratifying. Hamburg was not forgotten by Brahms, however, and when he was informed that the appointment he had sought as director of the Sing Academy and the Philharmonic Orchestra had been given to his friend Julius Stockhausen, Brahms was devastated. When Stockhausen retired five years later, the appointment again went to someone else, so Brahms felt doubly hurt by Hamburg. In fact, Brahms would probably have found such a regular and demanding job 
too onerous, too likely to distract from his composition. Vienna was in any case soon to give him the job of director of the Wiener Sing Academy. While he enjoyed the music, the administrative work that went with it was not to his taste and he quickly set his audiences against him by being too adventurous. Meanwhile, his family back home in Hamburg was going through upheavals. His mother, so much older than her husband, left him after 30 years of marriage. In 1865 she died and his father then took a much younger wife. All this made it less likely that Brahms would return to Hamburg. It also seemed to spur him on to a really large-scale work. In Bremen Cathedral at Easter in 1868, the Deutsches Requiem was performed for the first time. Brahms was very happy with the standard of performance and there was a big audience from the influential musical world. Of course, Clara was there and Stockhausen sang and his ladies' quartet from Hamburg had insisted on being in the choir. Back in Vienna, the important post of musical director of the Gesellschaft der Musikfreunde had become vacant. In spite of the difficulties he'd had with the Sing Academy, he was a major candidate. Musically, it would be very exciting, but the squabbling and arguing and sycophancy he would have to cope with nearly put him off. He took the job, however, and stayed for three exciting years. In 1871, he moved into the apartment at Karlsgasse 4, which suited him so well he was to keep it for the rest of his life. It was in the centre of town, just round the corner from the Karlsplatz, and also close to the Musikfreunde building, so it was doubly convenient. But three years in so prestigious a musical post was enough for him. He found it difficult to combine his desire for the highest possible standards of performance with his work at composition, and equally the board of directors found their famous conductor quite difficult to deal with. So he left amicably after three years and many fine performances. He was made a lifelong member of the Musikfreunde and used the library there like a second home. Although Brahms had been fortunate in gaining several very close friends in early life, he was basically a lonely and isolated man, wrapped up in his work and not ready to have more than superficial friendships with the many people who were ready to invite him to their homes or take him away on holidays. He was famously touchy and irascible, particularly in later years, and he even managed to fall out every now and again with Clara and Joachim, whom he considered his dearest and closest friends. His gruff letters to Clara over a memorial service to Robert Schumann made her think he didn't want his requiem performed there, though in fact he did. Joachim too was confused in this matter. Other friends had to intervene to show Brahms where he'd gone wrong. Tact and diplomacy were not his strong points. When his father died, however, he was genuinely concerned for the well-being of his stepmother, who had made his father's last years so happy, and he remained exceptionally supportive and loyal to her to the end of his life. Old friends came back. Elizabeth von Stockhausen, an old pupil, beautiful and talented, became his friend again as Elizabeth von Herzogenberg. Brahms was to spend many happy times with Elizabeth and her music-loving husband in Leipzig, though he eventually offended even them. Brahms took long summer holidays, where he enjoyed the country air and the company he found in the various spa towns he visited, like Bad Ischoff. The emperor stayed there in the summer, so it was a very fashionable place. This didn't put Brahms off. His good friend, the Waltz King, Johann Strauss, had a villa there, as did many other artists and musicians. 
Of course, the countryside round Ischl gave him plenty of opportunities for long walks, and although the weather was anything but reliable, he enjoyed Ischl and found it a good place to work. For a few winter months it became his habit to give concerts of his own works, conducting or playing. He was so much in demand that he could have performed all year round, but he liked to spend some time in Vienna in the spring and the summer in the country. Brahms continued to upset friends old and new. His faithful publisher was Fritz Simrock. For some time Joachim, who was an unusually jealous person, had suspected his wife of having an affair with Simrock. Brahms didn't believe it, and as he was very fond of the wife, wrote her a letter of support. They were eventually divorced, and Joachim was so offended that he broke off all contact with Brahms, fortunately not forever. Hans von Bülow, the conductor and one-time Wagner supporter, played a huge role in Brahms' later years. Von Bülow was an all-or-nothing enthusiast, and when Wagner ran off with his wife Cosima, daughter of Liszt, he turned from Wagner and took up Brahms, playing his works all over Europe and doing much to enhance the composer's reputation. At 50, Brahms met Hermine Spies, a young and vivacious contralto, who was to become one of the greatest interpreters of his songs and especially of the Alto Rhapsody. That Brahms fell in love with her seems all too likely, but although she inspired much of his work at the time, as usual with Brahms, art triumphed and nothing came of it. The last years of Brahms' life were considerably eased by the help he had from a young composer who had become librarian at the Gesellschaft für Musikfreunde in Vienna. Manduchowski admired Brahms and soon became a sort of secretary, helping him organize his life and his work, so that Brahms came to rely on him completely, referring to him affectionately as Mandy. If the emotional life of the master Brahms was a lonely one, his heart was also full, and when his great friend Clara Schumann was dying, he was driven to write the four serious songs, one of his most wonderful and moving works. He died himself not long afterwards in April 1897, leaving an amazing legacy of music and the Gesellschaft der Musikfreunde as his heirs. Brahms, unlike so many artists, enjoyed astonishing success from an early age. It was a success founded on his wonderful capacity to reflect through his music the aspirations, longings and joy of the people around him, which is what great art is all about. Brahms' music falls roughly into six groups. Purely orchestral music, chamber music for small groups of instruments, piano music, music for choirs and orchestra, sometimes with solo voices, vocal groups of various sorts, and a major element of Brahms' output, solo songs. Brahms destroyed many works not up to his exacting standards, so what we have is high quality. 
Brahms is probably best known through his orchestral music. He wrote four symphonies, number four in E minor standing out as one of the greatest of all symphonic works. He wrote a fine violin concerto in D major for his friend Joachim and two piano concertos. There is an unusual double concerto for violin, cello and orchestra. Of the lesser works, two overtures, the Academic Festival Overture and the Tragic Overture are constant favourites in the orchestral repertoire, as are his variations on the theme of Haydn. Two serenades make up this group. Brahms' chamber music was very important to him. He wrote three string quartets and three piano quartets and two sextets for two violas, two violins and two cellos. He enjoyed varying the balance of the instrumental groups and in his two string quintets, number one in F major and number two in G major, where he added an extra viola to the usual quartet, he achieved some of his most glorious work. In this group there are three piano trios, a piano quintet for string quartet and piano, two fine sonatas for cello and piano and three violin sonatas. One of his most popular works is the quintet in B minor for clarinet and string quartet. There are two sonatas for clarinet or viola and piano. For Brahms, a great pianist himself, the piano was an obvious instrument to write for. He wrote only three sonatas early in life, then branched out into a wide variety of variations on themes by, for example, Schumann, Handel and Haydn, ballads, capriccios, intermezzi, rhapsodies, fantasias and romances. There are 22 opus numbers in this group, but within each number many sets of short pieces. Two particularly popular works for two pianos are the Liebeslieder Waltzes or Love Song Waltzes, Opus 52a and Neue Liebeslieder, Opus 65a. These works were first composed for vocal quartets. From his earliest years, Brahms was involved in choral music and he wrote four large works for chorus and orchestra and a number of smaller ones. His Deutsches or German Requiem is for chorus, soprano and baritone solos and orchestra and is in the repertoire of every choral group. The Rhapsody, Opus 53 for contralto, male chorus and orchestra, based on a poem by Goethe, is a splendid and moving work. The Schicksal Lied, or Song of Destiny, is for chorus and orchestra, and the Triumph Lied has a baritone solo with chorus and orchestra. Brahms began his musical career conducting small vocal groups, and he continued to provide wonderful arrangements of Schubert songs and folk songs, as well as original part songs for varied groups of mixed, unaccompanied voices. He also wrote a number of fine vocal duets and quartets, sometimes originals, sometimes versions of his own solo songs, all with piano accompaniment. Amongst these are the charming Liebes Lieder Waltzes, Opus 52 and Opus 65, already mentioned in piano duet versions. The last group is of solo songs, around 200 in all, setting the finest poetry with all the power and passion Brahms could muster. They were printed in sets of five, eight, fifteen, whatever he produced, and there are no particular links. Liebes Troy, Love's Truth, in Opus 3, one of his earliest published songs, is typical Brahms, a full, rich melody, passionate and tender at once. He wrote these love songs all his life, and at the end, when Clara Schumann was dying, he wrote the Vier Ernstgesänge, four serious songs, with texts from the Bible, amongst the finest music he wrote. The essence of Brahms is in the passionate intensity of the Fourth Symphony, the richness and variety of the string quintet number no. two in G minor, and finally in the wonderful outpouring of the four serious songs, Brahms' own statement of his belief in man. <laughs>